I am not a number. I am a person. <laughs> In some place, at some time, all of you held positions of a secret nature and had knowledge that was invaluable to an enemy. Like me, you are here to have that knowledge protected or extracted. That's the stuff to give them. Unlike me, many of you have accepted the situation of your imprisonment and will die here like rotten cabbages. Keep going, beloved. The rest of you have gone over to the side of our keepers. Which is which? How many of each? Who's standing beside you now? I intend to discover who are the prisoners and who are the warders. I shall be running for office in this election. Not only does the state challenge the prisoners' individuality, but the power of the collective does so as well. The villagers who inhabit the village. The masses. According to many studies on the masses, such as Gustav Le Bon's The Crowd, the masses are not known as a conglomerate of rational individuals with unique points of view, but rather have the hallmarks of an irrational, destructive, and self-destructive collective of non-persons, sharing a unified mass consciousness. The villagers represent our society in toto, with their tenets of social responsibility, altruism, social harmony, conformity, collectivism, and the dominant ideology of the so-called welfare state. I have a choice. You do as you want. As long as it's what you want. As long as it is what the majority wants. We're democratic. In some way. Sir, why do you use people? Psychiatrists say it satisfies the desire for power. It's the only opportunity one gets here. It depends which side you're on. I'm on my side. Aren't we all? You must be new here. In time, most of us join the enemy against ourselves. Have you? The villagers wear colorful costumes, parade, attend community activities, and have fun. Some work, others live a life of complete leisure. But they are all curiously soulless. They are discarnate in the sense that they are not identified by face or physical being, but by a number on their lapels. They are devoid of a self or spirit. Their only concerns are comfort, safety, and satisfaction. They have no ideals, and nothing is really worth fighting for unless they're externally led to do so. They are the hollow men of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, C.S. Lewis's Men Without Chests, Heidegger's inauthentic Das Mann, the last men of Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, devoid of any spiritual or existential or even basic personal dimension. They are able to enjoy complacent, decadent lives as humanoids and automatons, with an army of psychologists and doctors on call to drug away their every doubt and negative mood, much like the drug population of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. All symptoms of that frustration complex disappear. Oh, completely. Splendid. And watch you don't overdo it, and keep taking those pills. I will. And remember, if you get another attack of egotism, don't wait. Go back to the hospital immediately. I gave him eight grains of mitol. Suspicion, doubt, these are factors of aggression. And the drug should preclude all such reactions. He's still very confused. Well, he's shocked, as I anticipated. Pavlovian methods are employed in therapy to stomp out any undesirable action. You find this very interesting. The treatment's based on Pavlov's experiments. With dogs? The patient has, or was it rats? Uh, dogs. The patient has been dehydrated. When he wakes, he'll be suffering from an insatiable thirst. <laughs> Don't tell me. It hurts you more than it hurts him. In society, one must learn to conform. <laughs> You'll get water when you are bathed. Go to the blue dispenser and lobotomies are employed, if necessary, for instant social conversion. The village is a place where manufactured happiness is provided. In the words of O'Brien in George Orwell's 1984, the choice for mankind lay between freedom and happiness. And for the great bulk of mankind, happiness was better. There will be music, dancing, happiness, all at the carnival, by order.
The function of the plethora of carnivals and appreciation events in the village is to serve as a safety valve for its politically regressive society. And like all such societies, recreation is limited to only what is deemed socially acceptable. Art is used to promote the edicts of the village and its leaders. In the Arts and Crafts Fair in the Chimes of Big Ben, almost every exhibit glorifies the image of number two. This echoes the use of art in the Soviet Union and in Nazi Germany to expound and bolster the ideology and champions of the state. All day long, villagers are assailed by music which is either gentle or rousing. The record stores are limited in their selections. Nothing that unsettles or breeds negative or rebellious thoughts. For as the village maxim goes, music should make a quiet mind. Sports do not exist in the village. The only thing resembling a kind of sport is the bizarre and ridiculous looking activity known as kosho. The closest thing to a team sport is the human chess games held in the town square. I'm the queen. Come and be the queen's pawn. And in this game, each player or member of a team amounts to nothing, since only the two chess masters who call out the moves are actually competing. The absence of sports within the village is most likely because its masters do not like the idea of prisoners developing skills which could be used to escape. Also, the village does not like the idea of competition between its inmates. Sports embodies the individual's will to win, and in the village, only the community can win. Literature, surprisingly, is not overtly censored in the village. We see people reading, but we're never told what they're reading. Since the village is a closed society, however, it is very doubtful that any subversive books would make their way to its book racks. The villagers, of course, believe they are free. But freedom to them is the freedom to shop or go to the cafe or to walk along the beaches. We're all pawns, my dear. Throughout the village are carefully placed warders who act like villagers, but who work directly with the control bureaucracy. Excuse me. Yes? Like a word with you. Well, you'll have to wait. All right. Forget it. Got him. Shall I watch number 34 instead? No, he's dead. Dead? When? It's none of our business. I got to know him quite well. He didn't know you, did he? Villagers are encouraged to snitch and spy on one another. Everyone is everyone else's keeper. Get me number two, quickly. To the villagers, dignity is not a consideration. So they have no qualms in wearing the most ridiculously silly uniforms of colorful capes, straw hats, and striped sailor shirts. In fact, these vibrantly colorful clothes are misleading and are specifically employed to mask the existential anguish and anxiety of the villagers. The same is true of the village's colorful architecture and landscape. It's also noteworthy that their uniforms are unisex, effectively desexualizing the village population. The village's otherworldly retreat-like setting calls to mind Jean Baudrillard's theories of the simulacra. It is a hyper-real simulation because it is based on copies of the real simulacra with no real origin or reality. Love? You're crazy. Yes. About you. You don't even know me. Well, I know how I feel. Who put you onto this? Nobody. Nobody would doubt me. It's easy, and I'm waterproof. A slight drizzle won't wash away my doubt, so don't try. I don't want to be near you. And everybody's near in this place, far too near. Do you think they'll ever release us? Let me know. I shan't be around. Love is not found in the village. We see occasional couples, but no families. In The Girl Who Was Deaf, 
Number six tells an embellished fairy tale of himself as a spy who thwarts the doomsday plot of a wannabe Napoleon to a group of small children. And that is how I saved London from the mad scientist. This is the first time we see children anywhere in the village. Whose are they? Why are they there? Perhaps the village is a society akin to that of Brave New World, in which even the raising of children has been handed over to the state by their docile parents. There's quite a bit of Plato's Republic to be found in the prisoner. Where did you find it? It found me. You're not allowed animals. Electronic, you see. No bullets. Can't kill anyone with them. Number two takes no chances. Fair non-alcoholic gin, whiskey, vodka. Looks the same, tastes the same. But you can't get me tidbit. No alcohol here, sir. Curiously, there is no church anywhere in the village. While there is an abundance of collective activities and rituals, there is none in the way of spirituality. The village is entirely secular. Number six's rejection of the village is incomprehensible to the villagers. But this is what one would expect. Modern men find nonconformists to be thoroughly inexplicable creatures. How could anyone reject this wonderful paradise in which, to borrow Arthur Jensen's words in the movie Network, all necessities are provided, all boredom amused, and all fears are tranquilized. The purpose of letting number six escape in many happy returns may have been not only to show him that they can reel him in again if he ever does succeed in escaping, but to try and convince him that life in the village really is preferable to the perilous and frightful outside world to which he is now a stranger. This is the attitude that has been adopted by the rest of the village population. The viewers of Speed Learn in the general do not participate in it because they are coerced to, but because they desire to integrate themselves into the culture. In doing so, they define themselves solely on their ability to recite facts that have been programmed into their minds via the television media. In the village, Homogeny is taken to the final degree in the elimination of names, both personal as well as the names of places and products. Mountains are referred to on the village maps as the mountains, forests as the forest, and so on. In Checkmate, when the villagers are playing the roles of chess pieces on a huge chessboard, a scene that's reminiscent of the surreal world of Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, a man standing in for a rook sees an advantageous move that the chess player doesn't, and he goes there without a given order. He is immediately apprehended. Check! White Queen's rook, sir. Moved without orders. Bring him in for treatment. Control room to hospital. Control room to hospital. Report to chess board. Call the substitute. Call the substitute. The substitute. The substitute. Call the substitute. Remove White Queen's rook to hospital. Remove White Queen's Rope to Hospital. Remove White Queen's Rope to Hospital. What's all that about? It's not allowed. It's the cult of the individual. What happens to him? He'll be well looked after. They'll get the best specialist to treat him. It is established early on in the series that as long as number six maintains a confrontational individualistic stance, he will stand out from the other villagers in a way that will make them fear him and even hate him for the disorder he brings. Hence their readiness to turn into lynch mobs against him. This is very similar to the hate hours in 1984, when Big Brother's subjects are urged to curse and rail against the hate figure of Goldstein. In Marshall McLuhan's essay entitled Media and the Inflation Crowd, he states, The greater the proximity and the greater the numbers, the greater the loss of individual significance and control. In crowds, people holler and push, essentially reverting back to a primal state of being. This state is what instigates the collective into a group dynamic and subsequent group action. There can be no mitigation 
We all have a social obligation to stand together. I don't contest the validity of the complaint. My point no is... No exceptions! All right. You say you're a poet. But you were composing when you failed to hear number 10's greeting. Neglect of social principle. Poetry has a social value. He's trying to divide us. His intentions are obvious. To stop us from helping this unfortunate girl. You're trying to undermine my rehabilitation. Disrupt my social progress. Strange talk for a poet. Reactionary! Rebel! Disharmonious! Rebel! Reactionary! Rebel! Disharmonious! Rebel! Rebel. Rebel. The episode A Change of Mind illustrates this group mentality most prominently, showing how mob hysteria can overtake a battered community to become hostile to even the most basic forms of independence. I assure you, no matter what significance you may hold for me, to the uh, village and its committee, uh, you are merely citizen number six who has to be tolerated and, if necessary, shaped to fit. Public enemy number six. If you insist. But public enemies cannot be tolerated indefinitely. Be careful. Do not defy this committee. If the hearings go against you, I am powerless to help you. We must warn you that if any further complaint is lodged against you, it will be necessary to propose you for the treatment known as instant social conversion. The episode illustrates how buzzwords can be used to incite such a mob in a desired direction. Mutualism number six. More you must now agree than just a game. They are socially conscious citizens and are provoked by the loathsome presence of an unmutual. They are sheep. Number six. Enough, he insists on rejecting our offer of help, so be it. There remains but one course open to us. Yes. I warned you. The community will not tolerate you indefinitely. You need a scapegoat. Citizens, unite! to denounce this menace in our presence. A scapegoat? Is that what you think it is? Allow me to assure you that after conversion, you won't care what it is. You just won't care. Ah, yes. The ordeal of social conversion. You'll soon have lasting peace of mind and adjustment to the social system. Drugs? Would drugs be lasting? What would be lasting is isolation of the aggressive frontal lobes of the brain. Your attention, please. Here is an announcement for all staff psychologists and psychiatrists. Those wishing to study the conversion of number six on the hospital's closed circuit television, please report immediately to the hospital common room. Thank you for your attention. Splendid number six, just in time for the procession.
Unmutual brings to mind the phrase own life from 1984, meaning individualism and eccentricity. The episode also most vividly depicts Orwell's concept of groupthink. The ease in which number six can turn the villagers against number two at the end of the episode also illustrates the irrationality of the group mentality. Number two is unmutual. Unmutual. Social conversion for number two. The unmutual. Number 86 has a confession that number two is unmutual. Unmutual. Look at it. An unmutual who desires to deceive you all. Your welfare committee is the tool of those who wish to possess your minds. Unmutual! 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 You still have a choice. Number two you can is still unmutual. salvage your right to be unmutual. individuals, Number your rights to truth and free thought. Reject this false world of number two. Reject it now! In Free For All, when number six runs for the position of number two, his supporters cheer to whatever he says, even the most meaningless slogans. The content of his speeches become irrelevant, since he already has the power of the crowd behind him. In your spare time, if you get it, what will you do? Less work! And more In that same episode, the two reporters for the Tally Ho newspaper do not even have their own numbers. They share one, and they switch numbers and roles during the episode. Congratulations. Come again. Allow me to introduce myself. I am number 113, and this is my photographic colleague, Smile. number 113B. We uh, contribute to the local newspaper, the Tally Ho, you know. Drive on. This is red-hot stuff, you know. Haven't had a candidate of your calibre for ages. Congratulations. How are you going to handle your campaign? No comment. Intends to fight for freedom at all Smile. costs. How about your internal policy? No comment. We'll tighten up on village security. Smile! How about your external policy? No comment. Our exports will operate in every corner of the globe. How do you feel about life and death? Mind your own business. No comment. The same reporter is even seen in two places at once, running off to publish the interview and the pictures for the election edition, then already hawking that very newspaper at a kiosk. Earlier in that episode, when number six declares his candidacy, giant placards with his picture on them appear out of nowhere. These two surreal scenes call to mind Marshall McLuhan's theory that time and space are reduced to nothing in the global village, and how information travels in an instantaneous matter. To you and to me, news is like air. We breathe it deeply, we draw it from far and wide. The episode Dance of the Dead portrays the death and life that one suffers in losing one's personal freedom and joining in the mechanical dance of the modern world. Uh, how many of these have you been to? This is my first and last. Don't be silly. Yes. Uh, who's saying that? You or the computer? Me. Just stop, stop. Uh, don't behave like a human being. It might just um, confuse people. You Only know. you are confused. They're not for long. There are treatments for people like you. Uh, I've turned some. She, uh, she must get instructions. Who do they come from? You see here tonight? The man behind the big door? Well, there's no need to know. This place has been going for a long time. Since the war? Before the war? Which war? A long time.
Further examples of mob mentality are also found in this episode, in which number six is sentenced to death for breaking the rules of the village by coming into possession of a radio. But they are really trying him for being a rebel. Knowing that soon his wild spirit will quieten and the foolishness will fall away to reveal a model citizen. That day you will never see. The tribunal accuses him of exerting dangerously independent and antisocial attitudes, merely for living by his own free will. Has anyone ever seen these rules? The sentence is death. Although he only suffers a social death, number six comes to realize just how alone he is and that no one is trustworthy. The point of this episode is that to live in the village means the death of one's selfhood, the death of one's hopes and dreams, and the death of one's relationship to the real world. Number six's former colleague is reduced to a blithering idiot and will be sentenced to die. The radio with a recorded message from a man who shares his despair is taken from him, and the body he finds washed up on the shore has been taken and made to look like him, ready to be sent out with his own identification cards pinned onto it. In the village, one is existentially dead and has about as much rights as a corpse. Society. Yes, sir. Society is a place where people exist together. Yes, sir. That is civilization. Yes, sir. The lone wolf belongs to the wilderness. Yes, sir. You must not grow up to be a lone wolf. No, sir. You must conform. Yes, sir. It is my sworn duty to see that you do conform. Yes, sir. How the villagers have become part of the crowd, or what Nietzsche calls the herd, can be deciphered in the basic framework of the narrative. Firstly, their physical freedom was denied within the confines of the village's boundaries. Secondly, their conceptual freedom is sacrificed when they mentally conform to the rules and ideas of the village. Once these are lost, their individual selfhood is obliterated, at which point they become susceptible to the methods of village control. Number six is denied his physical freedom, but he maintains his freedom of mind, and he does so most adamantly against those who have fully reciprocated to the demands of their captors and their peers. This is why, with some exceptions, depth of character is never found in any of the villagers, because there essentially isn't any. Without unique selfhood, the villagers have lost all identity and inauthentically talk, act, and think in accordance with each other and with the mandates of the village. Their names have been erased, and society has succeeded in making them mutual. We will tell you what to say. They're right, of course. They're right, of course. Quite right. Quite right. I'm inadequate. I'm inadequate. 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 Disharmonious. Disharmonious. I'm truly grateful. I'm truly grateful. Believe me. 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 Believe me.